can't women become priests? 1-833-288-EWTN. I don't understand why I have to earn salvation. 1-833-288-3986. Why do I need to confess my sins to a priest? What's stopping you? You, you, you? This is Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Hey everybody, welcome again to Call to Communion on this Wednesday afternoon here on EWTN. It's the program for our non-Catholic brothers and sisters. Yes, indeed, a program on a Catholic network for non-Catholics. How does that work? Well, let's say that you are a Presbyterian, Baptist, Methodist, Buddhist, whatever, and you've got a question about the Catholic faith that you just can't seem to get a, a good answer for, one that actually makes sense. Well, we're here to help you for that. Here's our phone number, 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. If you're listening to us today in, um, let's see, uh, what's a good L? What's a good L, David? Lithuania? If you're listening to us in Lithuania, well, here's a phone number just for you. One and then 205-271-2985. And, of course, you can always send us an email. The address for that, ctc at ewtn.com, ctc at ewtn.com. Charles Beery is our producer. Matt Gabinski is our phone screener. Rich Jesse handles social media for the program. If you want to ask a question via YouTube, or Facebook. We are streaming on both platforms. Just put your question in the comments box. Rich will see that. He'll send it to us here in the studio. Love to answer your question on today's program. Again, the phone number 833-288-EWTN. I'm Tom Price along with Dr. David Anders. Tom, how are you today? Very good. How are you? I'm doing decent. Thank you. Thanks for bailing me out with the L there. Oh, sure. Tomorrow is M. That'll be easy. Have you already made up your mind? I, I have. Okay, can't All wait right. to find out. All right. Uh, toward the end of the show, we received uh, a, a question from Pierre on YouTube watching us in the Netherlands. Uh, we, we couldn't tackle it on yesterday's show. We ran out of time. So here it is today. Pierre says, can you recommend a good book about St. Ignatius of Antioch? Thank you and blessings, Pierre, in the, 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 ne- in the Netherlands. Wow, that's a great question. I think the best place to start with Ignatius of Antioch is to, in fact, read the letters of Ignatius of Antioch. Okay. Um, almost everything we know about him is from those letters. I mean, he is mentioned in Eusebius's church history, but most of what we know about him is from the letters. So just just go read the letters. They'll, they'll kind of tell you what you need. That's really the first place to start. And there are any number of publications, any number of collections of the Apostolic Fathers. That's the period of history that he's from where you'll be able to find those letters. And then, again, what we know about uh, Ignatius is minimal. You'll find it in, in almost any textbook history of the early church. Okay, appreciate that. Thank you so much uh, for your email. Here's one now from Jeff, who says, My question concerns Sunday Mass. Every Mass, I see some folks arriving late, some that leave early. My question is, how late can you be or how early can you leave and still receive, quote, God credit for attending Mass. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, thanks. So if you look at the canon from the Code of Canon Law about the obligation to attend Sunday Mass, it conspicuously fails to answer your question. Ah. And you can understand why. Because if the Church said, well, you have to go to Mass on Sunday, and what that means is, you know, you have to make it by this time and stay until that time, well, then that would seem to suggest that what really matters is that you make it by this time and stay until that time, when the intent is that you make the whole Mass, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, now, there is a kind of uh, pious saying that circulates uh, in Catholic land that you should make it by the reading of the Gospel and stay through the communion. And, in fact, that's, that's so commonly repeated that for a long time I thought that must be in the, in the Code. And I went and looked at the Code, and the Code doesn't say that. Mm. Um, Obviously, well, to my mind, obviously, uh, life happens to people, especially those of us that have had lots of children and grandchildren and things, and tires go flat and all the rest of it. And and so, you know, if I'm if I show up a second late, I'm not I'm not, you know, squirming in my seat. My conscience is not pricked. Um, But uh, but the intent is that we go to mass and the the mass is the whole right. 
Yes, it is. Jeff, thanks so much uh, for your email. Here's one now from Carol. I have had many discussions with friends who have trouble with the phrase, lead us not into temptation. Do you have any idea what the original language that Jesus used to say these words was and what were the actual words that he used? Did Jesus believe our Father would lead us into temptation? Thanks, Carol. Yeah, thank you. Really appreciate the question. So I've I've studied this quite a bit because there was a, a hubbub a few years ago when some of the bishops' conferences around the world wanted permission to change the translations of the Lord's Prayer into their own vernacular languages uh-huh. in a way that would downplay God's active leading of people into temptation, and um, and they uh, you know they went they wanted to say. Uh, you know, may we not fall into temptation or something like that that would that would really take the take God out as a player. Uh-huh. So I thought, well, hmm, that's interesting. Let me let me dive into this more deeply. And I went back and I looked at the Greek, I looked at the Latin in the in the Vulgate translation, and then I read the commentaries of doctors of the church like Thomas Aquinas. And after all that, I said, nah, it really does say God leads. <laughs> that's really what the text says, and you can't you can't get away from that. And the, 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 the Greek verb that is in the New Testament that's translated lead is the very same word that's used in the story of the men who bring the paralytic into Jesus. So they, they carry him in and put him down at Jesus' feet. That's the very same word that's being used here, the don't lead us into temptation. That's a, that's a pretty strong active sense of participation there involved in that. So, yeah, God leads people into temptation. He absolutely does. And this is what Thomas Aquinas, who is, a, who is a very reliable authority, says about why God might do that. In fact, I was just reading today, I was just reading Thomas's commentary on, uh, on the, the, the story in Matthew 14 of uh, Jesus walking on the water to the disciples in the storm and uh-huh. Peter saying, if it's you, call me out to you, you know, mm-hmm. and Peter sinks. Um, as a kind of allegory for why God would allow some people to fall into temptation, the temptation here being symbolized by the, the tumult of the waves into mm. which Peter sinks. Mm-hmm. Right. So here's, here's uh, reason number one. Uh, reason number one is to uh, test your virtue and give you an opportunity to grow in merit. Okay. All right. So, you know, if, uh, if everything is easy for you, the old... The old um, you know, what is it, the Bowflex ad, no pain, no gain, right, right, right. Uh, comes into play. That We have to be able to flex our moral muscles to grow in virtue, and but that won't happen unless we're exposed to some kind of moral hardship that we have to overcome. Um, another reason would be to chastise uh, sinners. Sometimes temptation is the, is the punishment for sin. And finally, the opportunity to acquire merit. Carol, thanks so much for your email. Lots more straight ahead on Call to Communion. It's more than just another radio show. It's a beacon of truth. Fasten your seatbelt and find out why they call Deacon Harold Berg Sivers the dynamic deacon. Whether it's today's culture, sacred scripture, or the teachings of the church, Deacon Harold and his guests will help set you on fire for the Catholic faith. Join Deacon Harold for a fast-paced hour that sheds encouraging light on today's culture. Beacon of truth, starting Monday at 4 p.m. Eastern, only on EWTN Global Catholic Radio. This is Father Lawrence Liu. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us commit ourselves to the Blessed Virgin Mary, she who is the bearer of all life, Christ Jesus himself. And we ask the Blessed Mother to help us to be compassionate, to be courageous, but also to tell the truth as we strive and fight for an end to the evil of abortion as we fight for the sanctity of all human life from conception till natural death. Lord, give us strength in this struggle, in this time when we have to struggle against the civilization of death. Help us to build a new civilization based on your resurrection, one that will be filled with light and that will value life above all else. We ask this in your holy name, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's called a communion with Dr. David Anders on this Wednesday afternoon here on EWTN Radio. Our phone number 833-288-EWTN. If you have a question for Dr. Anders, 
288-3986. Here's a reminder, EWTN's Religious Catalog is your online destination for gifts and uh, what Mother Angelica used to call holy reminders for Lent and Easter. Buy Catholic Shop EWTNRC.com today. By the way, you can now receive regular emails from EWTN's Religious Catalog telling you what's up, what's new, and what's next. Visit EWTN.com and click on the word subscribe. All right, if you're ready now, let's go to the phones at 833-288-EWTN, beginning today with Rudolph in Baltimore, listening today on YouTube. Hey there, Rudolph, what's on your mind today, sir? Uh, Hi, thanks for taking my call. Uh, It has to do with the invalid baptism. Sometimes back, one of the uh, listeners had attended a baptismal rite, and he noticed a priest baptized with the word, we baptize you in the name of the Son of the Holy Spirit, which is invalid. Uh, he never corrected it as far as I know from the expression you had. My question is, I'm guessing that this happens sometimes, and the people that in, in the ceremony are not aware of it. So they go out of the chapel thinking everything is fine, the baby is baptized, and in fact he's not. And what happened? And they know, not thinking nothing is wrong, they don't do anything about it. But what happens now with that situation, with that child? Yeah, thanks. I appreciate the question. So keep in mind that God doesn't give us the gift of the sacraments because he somehow needs them in order to transmit grace to the soul and the teaching of the Catholic Church is that God can and does offer sufficient grace for salvation to every human soul, period, no matter what their circumstance is sociologically, and that people can and do come to the life of holiness and sanctity and go to heaven based on their response to grace so given. So what then do the sacraments add to the picture? Well, what the sacraments add is they 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 are a tangible sign audible, tactile, sometimes even olfactorily sensible sign um, to which God attaches a promise that grace will necessarily come through this instrument. So in the absence of a sacrament, you are not denied grace. What you are denied is the awareness that on this instance, in this location, on this occasion, and in this mode, grace is infallibly offered to you. And, and that certainty of the sacrament gives us great hope, gives us great encouragement, uh, gives us assurance, and is a great aid in our spiritual life. So take, for example, the soul who knows that he's validly baptized. Um, you know, before I was a Catholic, sometimes the question would occur to me, am I really a Christian? The Catholic need not ever ask that question. I was baptized on such and such a day. Yeah, that makes me a Christian, because Paul says, whoever is baptized has clothed himself with Christ. Or, you know, the, the, the Puritan would wonder, am I truly forgiven? Again, the Catholic need not wonder that. He can say, well, let's see, I went to confession on Saturday, and Father said, I absolve you, so I'm truly forgiven. Now, the, the fact of the Puritan's ignorance does not mean he's not forgiven. It means he doesn't know. Okay. That's where we got to leave it. Thanks so much uh, for your question today, Rudolph. That opens up a line for you right now at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Call to communion on this Wednesday afternoon here on EWTN. Let's go now to Jim, a first-time caller, driving through Nebraska, listening to the great Spirit Catholic Radio. Hello, Jim. What's on your mind today, sir? Hey, hi there, everybody. Um, well, a couple questions now that I listened to the last gentleman was, First of all, I'm confused with Peter in that Jesus ministered to his his uh, mother-in-law, mm-hmm. and and then also that the the church was to be built upon Peter, who was to be the first pope, but he was obviously married, according to that. And then the baptism then that you just spoke of is that through the sacrament that it happens that the instrument of the or the baptism occurs, or can someone be baptized without baptism of the Holy Spirit, I guess, is my my understanding yeah. of that when I received. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I understand the question. Thank you. So let's talk about Peter's marriage, first of all. Yeah, Peter was unambiguously married. What is not at all clear is what did that mean practically in the life of his ministry? 
Jesus, Peter said to Jesus, behold, have we not left, you know, our homes and fields and so forth for you? And, and Christ commends those who leave even their spouses uh, under the right kind of circumstances in pursuit of the kingdom of God. And Peter counts himself among that number. Now, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9 that, that, that uh, Peter had a right to take a believing wife along with him. And so there's some indication that, that in his itinerant ministry, he may have had a spouse that accompanied him. What isn't at all clear from the scriptures, and there's some reason to think otherwise, is whether or not Peter and his wife continued to have normal conjugal relations, right? And, and the, the evidence against that would be a longstanding tradition in ancient Christianity that when married people were ordained to the priesthood or the episcopacy, um, that they would cease from conjugal relations. Now, just so you know, in the modern Catholic Church, we do have married clergy. Mm -hmm. They are not required to refrain from conjugal relations. Neither are they elevated to the episcopacy or the papacy. So there are married Catholic priests that have typically come in from other traditions. Um, those guys are not going to become bishops and and, um, and and popes, right? Okay. Uh, so there is a very strong preference that's expressed in law for the celibate vocation. And again, Paul, who mentions Peter's right to take along a believing wife, also exhorts in 1 Corinthians 7, he says, let those who have wives live as though they had none. And I permit marriage as a kind of concession, but you would be better suited to be celibate because you're more fit to serve the church and concern yourself with the will of God. You don't have to worry about the will of your wife, right, to take care of her. Jesus, of course, was of celibate. St. Paul was celibate, and, and both of them held forth consecrated virginity and celibacy as the more objectively perfect way to holiness, though not for everyone. So because of that, there is a strong preference for celibacy across Catholic tradition. Even in those segments of the Catholic world where married clergy are more common, uh, in those traditions, like, say, Eastern Rite Catholic churches, where you do have married clergy, you're not going to have married bishops. They're typically drawn from the ranks of, of monks and religious and so okay. forth because, right. b because of this imitation of the celibacy of Christ and of St. Paul and the, the clear biblical preference for that. Jim, thanks so much uh, for your call today. Call to communion here on EWTN. Got a praise report uh, just came in from Don watching us on YouTube, David. Uh, Don says, good afternoon. After being lifelong Protestants, my wife and I will participate in the rite of sending in a few weeks. Lord willing, will be confirmed during Easter Vigil. Whoop, whoop. That's that, good news. That's Thank why we've for letting us know. Yeah, appreciate that. Here's Betsy now in Detroit listening on the great Ave Maria radio. Hello, Betsy. What's on your mind today? Hi. Uh, quick question. Saint Aug which mm -hmm. translation of St. Augustine of Hippo do you recommend, especially for young people in their 20s who like philosophy. Oh, yes, so yes, many yes. out there. Um, I, sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm thinking for just a second. Okay, the R.S. Pine. The R.S. Pine Coffin. Pine hyphen coffin, C-O-F-F-I-N. And I know it's an ironic name. I love Pine it. Coffin, I love you know? it. Um, that, that translation of the Confessions, I, I like a lot. Um, there is a, a very contemporary translation by a former philosophy professor of mine named Thomas Williams. Really? Who is a, no shabby translator of Augustine, let me tell you. Okay. Um, but uh, personally, I like, uh, I like the Pine Coffin translation, which is a Penguin edition. And, uh, and that's where I would go for the Confessions. Now, now for the other works of Augustine, uh, there is a public domain version of Augustine's works that came out in the 19th century. It's the, the Schaff edition of Augustine's works that uh, I utilize online because it's free, um, but it's, it's definitely more cumbersome uh, in terms of the, the English. And so there are, there are modern critical editions of Augustine that you'll find in academic libraries with, you know, with his collected works that are probably more readable, but they're also expensive. The Library of Christian Classics, you know, which kind of in the middle has, uh, has some translations of Augustine's uh, early and later writings from, say, you know, I, I'm trying to think when they, they were probably published in the 50s, um, and they're good as well. They're good as well. Very good. Betsy, thanks so much uh, for your call today. Call to communion here on EWTN. Myra is a first-time caller in Fort Worth, listening on the EWTN app. Hello, Myra. What's on your mind today? Hey, Dr. Andrews. Love your show. Love to learn so much from you guys. Uh, my question is, after we receive communion during Mass and we go back to the pew, do we kneel? And if so, 
when is it appropriate to get up? Even, is it at the end where he says, let us pray, or thank at you. the end of the glass? Well, thank you so much. I appreciate the question. While the priest is purifying the, uh, uh, the vessels, we remain kneeling because the whole reason for the purification is that there are particles of the Blessed Sacrament that right. could remain, so we're still kneeling out of well. reverence for them. When the priest sits down after he's purified the vessels, that's typically when, when lay people will also sit down. Now, if uh, you know if you're of a certain age or a certain medical condition and you, know, you just can't kneel for that long, you've got arthritis in the knees or something, we all understand that, so sure. you go take your seat. But if you can, you know, if it's not a burden to you, unnecessary burden, then uh, yet yeah, kneel is until the priest sits. Appreciate your call today, Myra, from Fort Worth. Call to communion here on EWTN. couple lines open for you at 833-288-EWTN. If you have a question for Dr. David Anders, 833-288-3986. And uh, Benjamin in St. Louis called and asked, what is the Catholic stance on tithing? Um, yeah, thanks. I appreciate the question. So there is no obligation to tithe 10% of your net or gross uh, income, you know, uh, the adjusted gross income from your tax return. You, there is no requirement in canon law that you give 10% of that number um, to the church or to a charity or whatnot. And uh-huh. the, what the church says instead is that we have an obligation to support the temporal needs of the church. So we have to we have to give of our of our resources to support the church. Um, the exact portion that you give is going to be dependent on your charity and circumstances. Uh, you know, St. Paul emphasizes when he was going around making collection for the poor in Jerusalem, set something aside, I'll come pick it up when I come, but God loves a cheerful giver who gives out of love and not out of compulsion. Mm-hmm. Christ and John the Baptist give interesting formula. They say if a person has two coats, so give to the guy that has none. Well, you do the math on that, that's like 50%. Yeah. You know? Um, when Zacchaeus had his repentance, uh, he he'd pay back, you know, what what was it, you know, four or five fold yeah. what he stole. So who knows what that was in in terms of his income? Mm-hmm. I, I imagine that was a. I'm try, I've always tried to do the math on that. I mean, he must have had gain that wasn't ill gotten because if everything he had was ill gotten gain, he had to go massively into debt to pay back four times what mm-hmm. he'd stolen. You yeah. know, so I don't know how he did that math, but it was still, you know, it was above and beyond as the is the point of it. But at the same time, the church teaches that people have a have a have a duty, not just a right, but a duty, to uh, provide for their families, and that would include, um, you know, building up something of a nest egg to take care of them sure. in their retirement and things like that. So you don't you don't have to beggar yourself to take care of the church, and and uh, and you know there are, there are seasons of life where you may not be able to give anything at all, or if you do, you give only a token. Mm-hmm. Remember the, the 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 widow who gave two mites, and sure. Jesus said she put in. More than all the rest. So, uh, the measure is charity, not uh, not some strict mathematical proportion. Now, having said that, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops says here's a formula you might use. You might give five percent of your income to your parish and five percent to the charity of your choice. But again, that's that's by way of suggestion, not not by way of mandated law. There you go. And uh, Benjamin, thanks so much for your call from St. Louis today. A uh, great hypothetical question here from Mike in North Carolina, uh, writing on behalf of his son, Jimmy, who says, My son asked this question. If one atheist wants to kill Christians and a second atheist tries to stop him and dies, can this count as martyrdom even though the atheist had no faith? Um, yeah, thanks. I appreciate the question. No, that wouldn't, that wouldn't count as martyrdom. Mar- martyrdom really is technically... Um, you know, dying, uh, you know, because of, uh, you know, odium fide. You're, you're killed precisely because of your attachment to the faith. Okay. Right. Um, now, uh, what is the name? A friend of mine just told me the story of a, of a convert and martyr in antiquity. And um, I'm going to say it's like Canisius or Galicius or Cashmisius or something <laughs> like that, you know. Uh, but anyway, he was a Roman actor. And I just learned this story recently. Yeah. And he he was contracted to put on a play mocking Christians. And so that was his goal. He wanted to get on stage and make fun of Christians. And in the in the context of the play and performing it, he was kind of cut to the heart and convicted of his mockery of these noble people who lived such exemplary lives and died the death of martyrdom. And he stepped off the stage and asked for baptism. Wow. He wasn't given baptism and he was killed. 
Wow. And the church venerates him as a martyr. Beautiful. And that's in that story. That's a marvelous story. Yeah. And, and and as I'm uh, as I'm looking at this great question from Mike and Jimmy, his son there in North Carolina, it makes me think, well, you know, he he may not have been a martyr, but he certainly did something heroic. Yes. So we'll uh, have to leave it at that. Uh, Mike and Jimmy in North Carolina, thank you so much uh, for your email today. And by the way, if you'd like to send us an email. Genesius. For... Genesius. I looked him up. Good man. Yeah. If you'd like to send us an email for a future show, here's the address, ctc at ewtn.com, ctc at ewtn.com. We try to tackle a few emails on each of our live programs. Coming up in just a couple of moments, it'll be Ralph in Chicago watching us on YouTube. He's got a great question regarding sin and indulgence. Well, uh, that means a couple lines are open for you right now at 833 833- 288-EWTN. Not too late to call. 833-288-3986. Call to communion on this Wednesday afternoon here on EWTN. Do stay with us. I firmly believe that prayer is communication with God. And if we know that God is a loving Father, why wouldn't we want to talk to God? The reality is we've got to talk to our family, we've got to talk to our friends, and if God is real, and God is definitely real, He wants to hear about our day. He also wants to know how we're doing and what our needs are. Prayer is communication with God. This is Monse Alvarado. Join me for topics that matter to you on EWTN News In-Depth, Friday night, 8 Eastern, on EWTN Radio and Television. Jesus told a parable about workers in a field. Some started at sunrise, some started at the end of the day. And when they lined up for their pay before heading home, everyone got paid the same amount. Of course, the guys who showed up at sunrise complained. Why do we get the same pay as the guys who showed up at the end? And the boss said in reply, if I'm going to be generous, why are you complaining about that? We love justice. We love our pay. We love to demand our pound of flesh if someone's wronged us. We love getting what's coming to us. And you know what? That's fine. There's something about natural law that makes us want what seems the most fair. But there's something better than fair. It's mercy. It's giving to people who don't deserve. It's lending to people who could never pay us back. It's forgiving even when someone couldn't possibly earn it. That's how God is toward us. It's how he calls us to be toward each other. This is Chris Stefanik from reallifecatholic.com on EWTN Radio. EWTN. Live truth. Live Catholic. Whom or what are you praying for? Let us know tomorrow on Take Two with Jerry and Debbie. On most of these EWTN stations. Now back to Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders. It's called a communion here on EWTN. Our phone number, 833-288-EWTN. Not too late to call, 833-288-3986. If you wait much longer, it will be too late to call. You'll have to wait till tomorrow. So again, 833-288-EWTN. Congratulations going out to another member of the EWTN radio family, and that would be Carolina Catholic Media, 1270 AM, serving the greater Charlotte area, celebrating four years with us this week. Congratulations to David Papandria and his great team there at Catholic, Catholic, Carolina Catholic Media from your friends here at EWTN. Uh, thanks for um, being a Catholic radio believer, David, and all of your great team there in Carolina. All right, now we're going to go to uh, Ralph in Chicago watching us on YouTube this afternoon. Hey, Ralph, what's on your mind today, sir? Hi, thank you for taking my call. Sure. Uh, I think we're going to be able to resolve this issue about plenary indulgences and the attachment with venial sin. My understanding is if a per- if a person resolves, and like they do in confession, firmly resolve with the help of thy grace to confess my sins and do penance and, and to amend my life, amen, is that the same for getting a plenary indulgence if you resolve not to commit a venial sin in the future? Yeah, thanks. I appreciate the question. So let me 
Let me offer an analogy. Uh, if you've ever hung around people who are in 12-step recovery programs, they're, uh, they've been addicts. There isn't a one of them that, that doesn't find the substance or practice to which they're addicted attractive. They, they find it attractive. That's, that's why they're in their recovery program. Sure. But the old timers who have made it in there for a while, they have no desire to give themselves back over to this thing that they find attractive because they know that it wrecks havoc on their lives. Yeah. And, and so um, I, I say that because sometimes when people encounter this idea of no attachment to sin, they think, well, gosh, I'm attached to all kinds of sins because I, I really like those things. They're very pleasant, and I would like to dive into them. That itself is not the same thing as an attachment, right? Um, the attachment we're talking about is this resolution, this, this kind of, I'm going to make a place in my consciousness where I can contemplate the possibility of doing that. But if I form the resolution, just like the addict who says, you know, I've hit rock bottom, I know where that road leads, uh, you know, one is too many and a thousand is never enough, mm -hmm. I'm not going back, that's what we're talking about. Okay. Appreciate that. And uh, Ralph, thanks so much for your call this afternoon from Chicago. Let's go now to Steve, a first-time caller from Waco, Nebraska, listening on the Great Spirit Catholic Radio. Hello, Steve. What's on your mind today, sir? Hello? Hi, Steve. Yeah, I'm kind of tailgating on a question that I just heard earlier. I just tuned in and didn't get it all. But I was told once that when it comes to tithing, the 10% that God expects should go to the church, and any charity after that is considered a mission. Because yeah. um, if I if I tithe to the LBGQ, no, that's not a godly charity at all. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate the question. So Catholics are not obligated to tithe 10% of their income to the church. They are not obligated to. We are obligated to support the temporal works of the church, and that's one of the precepts of the church. Um, and uh, But we're also obligated morally to give alms, to give alms to the poor, uh, you know, to try to better our common man, uh, fellow man, the common good. And, and there, is no, there is no limit on how much we can or should give to, uh, to give in alms. I mean, Tobit says that alms atone for sin. I mean, who doesn't want their sins atoned for? You yeah. know? And, uh, and Jesus says if we give alms in secret, then our Father who sees us in secret will reward us. Um, but uh, but there's no need to you know conceptualize that within some sort of legal schema of obligation you know to a mathematical proportion. Okay, is that helpful for you, Steve? Yeah, it was. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your call. Here is Henry now in Kansas City, Kansas, uh, where everything is up to date. <laughs> Watching us on YouTube this afternoon. Hey, Henry, what's on your mind today? Hello. I was calling to ask about uh, if there are Protestant parents of young children who become convinced of Catholicism but are in a really solid Protestant community with good formation and charismatic preaching and find the Catholic options in their area to be really lackluster and unhelpful, should they be tempted to stay Protestant for the spiritual needs of their family and development, or is it always better to be in truth even if it's a weak community? Yeah, thanks. I really appreciate the question. Um, th there's some complication here. I want a few thoughts. The first one is that, look, I'm going to sound bigoted when I say this, and I really don't mean to be because I, like, I have a lot of respect for my Protestant upbringing and my Protestant parents and my Protestant friends, and mm, a lot of yeah. them learned from the tradition. Personally, I don't think there's such a thing as good, solid, charismatic formation in a Protestant church. If there were, it would be Catholic, right? I mean, sure. there's enthusiastic, there's compelling there's engaging, there's highly articulate, there's, there's theologically reasoned preaching in a Protestant church. Maybe there's emotionally appealing preaching in a Protestant church, but if it's Protestant, at root, what it's proclaiming is a kerygma that isn't the biblical kerygma, that isn't the Catholic kerygma, that isn't the truth about Christ. So, I mean, if a Protestant preacher gets up and is very persuasive and compelling that a man is saved by faith alone— and and, uh, and 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 not by any transformation of his moral life, and that Christ's righteousness is imputed to him because of Jesus's atoning death, understood as a substitutionary sacrifice. That's not the gospel. That's Calvinism. Yeah. Right. Which I personally believe is uh, is ultimately very harmful 
to society and to the human soul. Um, so I don't, I don't think you can have good charismatic uh, preaching in a Protestant church. If you did, it would be a Catholic church. Um, and now, what I will acknowledge is that you can have, you can have strong social ties um, and, and uh, positive psychological experiences that help build family identity and, and community solidarity and, and lots of things that are beneficial to the person and to the soul in a Protestant church. I, I completely agree with that. And one of the most common complaints that people have on leaving those kinds of Protestant communities for a Catholic parish is the horrible sense of loneliness that they experience when they become Catholic and they step into a community where they don't know anyone and no one seems particularly keen on getting to know them. Mm. And that is a fault of the Catholic parish and one that's shameful, in my opinion, uh, but it's a reality that some people have to face. Now, remember that the, the ultimate motive for becoming Catholic is that you follow your conscience. Right, because your conscience has become persuaded that this is the truth about God and the moral life, and this is you know so so on and so forth, and uh, and I and I have to do that. If I don't do this, I'm going to disobey my conscience. I can personally contemplate a situation where a person is unsure in their conscience of what they're to do, and faced with the kind of dilemma that you have described, they are they're on the horns of they're all on the horns of that dilemma, yeah, and it doesn't yeah. appear because they've got different they've got conflicting criteria, both of which have to do with a moral good. And they don't know how to balance those scales. Well, if that's the situation, then my advice is get off that dilemma, figure the answer to that question, understand in conscience what the right thing to do is, and then go do it. And I'm not going to tell you what the answer to that question is. I've been asked by people point blank before, should I become Catholic? Now, this show is all about why you should become Catholic. So you know, like at the end of the day, what I think about that question. But my answer is, is, is this has to be your decision. Yes, right. and, and you've often said, well, you don't have to do it today. And you don't have to do it today, exactly. And you don't have to do it in, the, in, in a way that is deliberately uh, sort of constructed to cause the maximum damage to your, the fabric of your social life and family. I mean, all that sort of thing. Certainly. So get, get convinced in your conscience and then follow conscience, which is the aboriginal vicar of Christ. Great call, Henry. Thanks so much for checking in from Kansas City. One last thing, though. Yes. All right. Um, Let's say that the only parish you can join is one where you feel like the the uh, the social or catechetical environment is uh, is deficient. That's a shame, but I realize it's a reality. My recommendation in that circumstance is don't just rely on your parish. Mm. That you find other forms of Catholic identity, other forms of Catholic social organization, other forms of Catholic catechesis, uh, other forms of Catholic friendship. Uh, to nourish that that lacuna, that Catholic parish, media, Catholic media sure. that should be that should be speaking to your family, but for whatever reason isn't. Thanks again. Call to communion here on EWTN and listens to us in uh, Groton, Massachusetts, on the station of the cross. And says, Doctor Anders, my brother, my mother's brother, my mother's brother is dying of cancer. My mother is upset to learn that he does not have a plan to have a Catholic funeral, although they were raised Catholic. He plans to be cremated and have a remembrance service at a secular facility. My question is, does a Catholic making this decision have any effect on the salvation of their soul? Um, yeah, thanks. So here's one thing that I'm never going to do. I'm never going to tell you that some soul is in heaven or in hell, unless that's a canonized saint. Yeah. Then I'll tell you they're in heaven. Otherwise, I'm never going to pass judgment. Okay. Um, uh is that an optimal situation? Obviously not. Obviously not, right? I mean, the, the Catholic position would be that you want somebody to die reconciled to the Church and with all of the sacraments and with good faith and, and, uh, and a clean conscience, right? And so if there, it's some removed from the Church, that I'm going to regard that as problematic. What I can't do is tell you that I understand the reasons they're at odds with the Church, right? And yeah. so, like, it's, it, it would be very different, for example. Let's say you have some priest— who gets mad at his bishop and uh -huh. says, "Well, I'll show him," and then uh, and then you know goes into schism or apostasy and and dies you know embittered, right? That would be one situation, and this you know, causing great public scandal. Here's another situation. Let's say you have someone that was uh, sexually abused by a priest when they were a child and permanently wounded and scarred in a mm -hmm. way that they can't approach a Catholic church without a kind of horror covering over their soul, right? Um, those people are not in the same moral situation with respect to distance from the church. And obviously I would, 
I, I, I would, and I think God probably would too, I'm not putting words in God's mouth, but I think that's what our moral intuition would say, uh, is not going to judge them the same. Sure. Okay, and there it is. Uh, call to communion here on EWTN. This is last call for your call at 833-288-EWTN. We can take one or two more calls before we have to uh, close up shop here. 833-288-3986. Hey, be sure to join us for the Catholic Sphere, one of our great weekend programs. It's coming up on uh, Sunday afternoon, 2.30 p.m. Eastern, here on EWTN Radio. This week's host is Doug Keck. He'll be discussing the role of the laity in secular affairs. Do check it out Sunday afternoon, 2.30 p.m. Eastern, only on EWTN. Here's a question now from Michelle. Dr. Anders, why is it okay for the church to collect first-class relics, such as hair or bone, for veneration, but an individual wouldn't be allowed to retain a sampling of ashes after cremation. One could keep it for veneration of their loved one, who may very well be a saint as well. Doesn't seem right that the church doesn't allow this. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Michelle. I appreciate the question. The reason is that when most people collect ashes, they don't do so for purposes of veneration. Mm. They do so for a superstitious reason. And that's why the church historically did not allow cremation and now only allows it when superstition has been specifically excluded as a motive. Uh, by contrast, there's nothing that would prevent uh, the faithful from, say, clipping a lock of hair from your loved one to yeah. keep it for veneration. And I, in fact, have a lock of my dad's hair in a locket on my desk at home for that purpose, right? Nice. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, the law on cremation is, uh, is, is specifically to avoid particular types of superstition. Very good. And thanks so much uh, for your question. Here's one from Eric in Apollo, Pennsylvania. Dear Dr. Anders, I have the greatest respect for you and your show. Does the Pope have the authority to change church doctrine concerning marriage and homosexual acts? Nope. That's Simple it. answer. Nope, he doesn't. You know, the Pope can't suddenly declare that two plus two equals five. Can't do it. Nope. All right. Appreciate that. And uh, Eric, thanks so much uh, for your email from Apollo, Pennsylvania. Let's go now to Tom in Texas, uh, watching us today on Facebook. And Tom, what's on your mind today, sir? Okay. Uh, there were questions about tithing, and uh, I, I didn't hear anything about uh, offering in terms of uh, your time, your talent, and your treasure. And uh, I'd like your opinion on that. Sure. Well, St. Paul tells us that our duty as Christians and our spiritual act of worship is to offer our bodies in living sacrifices. And that, that's, like, like, that's everything. That's time, talent, treasure, thoughts, imagination, relationships, you name it, all to be offered uh, to God. And he spells it out, he cashes that out a little bit in 1 Corinthians, where he talks about the different kind of charisms that Christians can have. Some some people have knowledge. Some people have teaching. Some people can are good at help, good at helping. Others are good at administration. He sort of lays them all out there and says they're all given to the body of Christ for the sake of the common good. The implication is you take what you've got in terms of your your giftings, uh, and you put them to use for the sake of the common good of the church. Beautiful thing, Tom. Thanks so much uh, for checking in in Texas. Like for example, Tom here is just the 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 most killer lector you've ever heard in your life. <laughs> You're you know? very kind. He's got that radio announcer voice going on, and I'm like, man, that's some serious talent. I'm just giving back. That's right to the Lord what He gave to me. Here's a question now from Ray. Good afternoon. I am a listener to Call to Communion. I am a Catholic from birth. I recently listened to a YouTube video, and the priest talked about Saint Leonard of Port Maurice. He was speaking of an archdeacon of Lyon, France, who died and then appeared to his bishop, saying at the same hour of his death, 33,000 Catholics passed away. Out of this number, St. Bernard and he went up to heaven. Three went to purgatory. The rest were condemned to hell. He used another example where 60,000 died. Only three went to purgatory and the rest were damned to hell. If this is the case, how can we hang on to hope? Yeah, thanks. I appreciate the question. I have to. I have to throw this out there. Our, our, our caller said that he was Catholic from birth, and I thought, gee, he he beat me. I've just been Catholic since baptism, <laughs> right? So you know, m most people are just Catholic from baptism. Good even one. If you Good were baptized one. Baptized yeah. as an infant. Um, now, uh, well, personally, I I don't put a lot of stock in private revelation uh, when it comes to orienting 
myself definitively in the moral life, right? That yeah. I, I, that the, the promises of Christ, Scripture says that uh, in Christ, in the promises of Jesus, we have all we need for life and godliness. All we need for life and godliness. All we need for life and godliness, which is why the church has always taught that the public revelation of the church is the deposit of faith taught by Christ and the apostles and handed down by sacred tradition. That's what all Catholics are bound to believe, and in that we have all we need for life and godliness. And private revelations are private. That is to say they're given to specific individuals at specific times in specific social historical circumstances for specific reasons. They don't have universal validity. And, and uh, you're not obligated to believe that any private revelation is veridical, meaning you don't have to even hold that it happened. Uh, and if you do hold that it happened, which you're allowed to, if it's an approved revelation, you don't have to hold that it's of universal validity. So maybe that's the message that that bishop needed on that day. Mm. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, because it, he needed to have a particular thing evoked in his soul, uh, that I don't need, and therefore I'm not, in, until Leonard of Maurice, Port Maurice wants to appear in my bedroom, you know, <laughs> then it would be my private revelation, and that's the way you handle it. Ray, thanks so much uh, for your email, and here's a question. This is an anonymous listener in Iowa. Dear Dr. Andrews, you recently responded to a woman feeling guilty that she raised her children Lutheran and her daughter-in-law converted from Catholicism. Well, that's very much like our family. Although I don't harbor any guilt, I do suffer from worshiping alone at Mass and being spiritually isolated from my family. I've learned so much more about the truth, goodness, and beauty of our faith, thanks in part to your show. But any attempt to show my husband and family what's lacking in Protestantism is brushed off. We have had many, many arguments about religion, and we are both so wounded. I just can't seem to have any peace despite reading the wisdom of the saints like St. Francis de Sales. How do I truly turn this over to God when I'm convicted that he desires unity? Thanks, Anonymous from Iowa. Yeah, thanks. So anytime we suffer, that suffering is an occasion for us to unite ourselves to Christ. And don't you think Jesus uh, was wounded in his soul about the disunity in his family? And, and, and don't you think that was a, an expression of his charity? And if you are similarly wounded, then that's just another way for you to get closer to Jesus. This is what we call redemptive suffering. And so um, you can you can actually take a kind of rejoicing in your lack of rejoicing, if that makes any sense, that paradox. There. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then secondly, I think you ought to recognize that um, uh, these people, your family members, are in God's hand, and he loves them more than you do and desires their salvation more than you do. And, um, and look, you know, I— I, this is why the church says we allow Catholics to marry non-Catholics, but we don't recommend it. Because it, you know, if you if you do this, you will have trouble. Um, you had trouble, and I'm sorry for that. I really, my heart goes out to you. Uh, but the uh, but again, the trouble itself can be redemptive in your own life and theirs too. Yeah. So you know, trust in the providence of God. That he he knows what he's doing, and he loves them more than you do. Anonymous in Iowa, thanks so much uh, for your email. Here is Nick in Phoenix, listening on Sirius XM, Channel 130. Nick, what's on your mind today, sir? Just a point of clarification. The previous caller had called in asking if the Pope could change the Catholic teaching on marriage. And the answer was no, and that is the correct answer. But there is a prevailing view in the media that the Pope, Pope Francis has changed the church is teaching on marriage. So I just want a clarification that this, this is not accurate, what's being reported in the media. Uh, it's not accurate, what's being reported in the media. Francis has not changed the, the theological or canonical definition of marriage or its requirements. He has no power to do so. Um, you know, what, what has come out is a statement from the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith on, on the pastoral meaning of blessings in contexts in which priests can and cannot bless people in couples, um, but uh, but it, that document itself restates quite forcefully the indissolubility um, and primacy of, well, the unique uh, status, I should say, of the union of a man and a woman uh, for the sake of raising a family, and that, and that alone is called marriage. Yeah. Nick, thanks so much uh, for your call today. Uh, question now from Raphael. Are Matthew and Luke of the Twelve Apostles? And how were they integrated into the church and its history? 
Thank you. Matthew was one of the 12. Uh, Luke was not. Luke was a companion of St. Paul. Uh-huh. And St. Paul was an apostle, but also not one of the 12. I'm not sure I know what you mean by how they integrated into the church and her history. I mean, except that, you know, the 12 were foundational pillars. Yeah. And so they have a role in the church's constitution that's unique. Um, uh, you know, Luke was uh, a, a physician. He was a companion of Paul and, uh, and was inspired by the Holy Spirit as he wrote his, uh, his two-volume history of the Jesus movement that we call Luke-Acts. Now, there is a, you know, a discipline called higher criticism where critics look at the way uh, they, they try to get at what went into the composition of the different Gospels, what's behind the text, if you will. And uh, from a higher critical point of view, there's something really interesting about Luke that, that displays his, uh, his physician identity. You know, the woman with the issue of blood? Yes. All right, who, who it wouldn't stop. And, and, and the, the other Gospels write that, um, uh, that, um, uh, that she'd wasted all her monies on, on, her do- on doctors that, you know, did nothing for her. And Luke tells the same story. He says no doctor was able to heal her. Ah, there's a difference. Yeah, he tones it down. He, he kind of gives a break to the medical profession <laughs> yeah, of his day. Just a little bit. Mm-hmm. Here's a, a question now from Barb. Dr. Anders, would you happen to have book suggestions that tell of and explain the history and traditions surrounding the stories of the Bible? For example, I'm looking for history that would discuss the Jewish tradition, that healings were expected to accompany the Messiah's coming. Maybe a world history book would be a good start. What do you think, David? Oh, uh so the question is, a book that would describe like where the where the stories of the Bible came yes, from is that the yes, idea? Okay. Uh-huh. So that that you're really asking a question about higher criticism, okay? Uh-huh. Uh huh. About you know about the a question about the Bible's composition, and there there is a book that I would that I would point you to, and I will I will warn you it's not by a Catholic, and so it's not seeking to present a position that's necessarily faithful to all the church teaching, mm-hmm. but it's a very scholarly book um, that gives a you know pretty up-to-date account of what the scholarly consensus is on the composition of the Bible, and it's by the Jewish scholar Richard Elliott Friedman, and it's called Who Wrote the Bible? Um, but, I, you know, I, I, I mentioned that with some degree of caution, because if you're if you haven't been exposed to higher criticism before, he pulls no punches, punches and it might be disturbing to tender consciences. Um, but uh, but from a scholarly point of view, I mean, it's you know, it kind of gives you where the scholarly consensus is. Great. And we'll close with this one from Christina. What is the relationship between your veganism and Catholic ethics? Will veganism help me avoid gluttony? Does it make us better stewards of the animals God placed under our dominion in the Garden of Eden? And do you find that it's simply the kinder way to live? Yeah, thanks. So if you go back into the second century and later of the patristic era, you find uh, a fair amount of writing on the church fathers about what we eat and how we should conduct ourselves with respect to food. Um, Clement of Alexandria, for example, says you should eat whole grain bread rather than refined flour. Oh. You, should, you shouldn't get rid of the, the husk, you know. And, and, uh, and, and there's a lot in there about not gorging ourselves on delicacies, that sort of thing. There's a long tradition in the church of fasting from meat. Um, and Thomas Aquinas writes about you know, certain foods uh, tend to excite the passions more than others. And now with what we know about neurotransmitters, that we know there's a scientific basis for that, you know, exactly. Um, and so our relationship to food is something that the fathers and the doctors wrote and thought a lot about. Uh, the Benedictine rule specifies a pound of bread a day and a henna of wine as the normal allotment for the monk, along wow. with, some, with some vegetables and very rarely meat. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, you can easily integrate veganism into a Catholic conception of asceticism and our relation to food and gluttony. And the points you make about care for the environment also can come into it as well. Christina, thanks for your email. But Dr. you don't have to. Got it. Dr. David Anders, thank you, sir. Thanks, Tom. See you tomorrow here on Call to Communion. God bless. The most original and exclusive.